We Have Ways of Making You Talk presents The Cauldron by Zeno, read by Al Murray. Chapter 9. Bridgman and Bilting had left the platoon headquarters, to the rear and to the right of Gorman's section, and dropping off 200 rounds of 303 with a sergeant, they slipped into the cover of the trees which shielded Ramsden's platoon. From there, they made their way down the slope to the road and track junction at the bottom, where Blake's men were dug in, watching the track to the north and the grounds of the house opposite them. Bilting distributed the ammunition while Bridgman and Blake talked together. What's the ammunition position like generally? the sergeant asked. Murray checked at first light, and at that time we were 50 rounds up on what we started with. On top of that, we have 11,000 rounds of MG42 ammo and eight of their guns to fire it through. We've nine or ten schmices as well, but not much fudder for them. And the rest of the company? Not as well off as we are, but at least they're living off the country. I don't think the old man has had to part with any yet, and I expect there'll be an inquest before he does. Alan looked round the position. It was well dug and the weapons pits well sighted. It was camouflaged and from somewhere had come old doors and bulks of timber which, propped back over the trenches, would give some protection from airburst. Leaving Blake, he and Bilting walked across the ground with its sparse cover which separated them from Marsden and his men, waiting at the northeast corner with their right flank just short of the house which marked the beginning of Brown's position. Bilting was a few paces in front of Bridgman, walking with his head down, bent under the weight of the full bandoliers which hung from his shoulders. They had passed their own slit trench when Bridgman spotted the German soldier standing on the far edge of the road by the gate to the grounds of the big house. He froze, flat-footed, his hands linked in front of his belt and the bandoliers dragging, a dead weight on his arms. It seemed impossible that the German had seen none of the men in position 20 yards in front of him and on the rising slope only just above the level of his eyes. Alan glanced down to his right where Marsden's Bren group were dug in. He saw Lance Corporal Hudson and the Belfast gunner, Laverty, their heads turned to each other, and he caught the faint murmur of their voices. He felt his nostrils dilate under the pressure of the anger which surged up inside him. He threw a quick look towards Bilting. His runner had halted, the heel of one foot still off the ground, his head thrust forward like a pointer and his eyes fixed on the German. Time stood still as the solitary figure looked casually about him and Bridgman's mind raced. Blake's men might have the German covered from the road junction. Brown's men might have spotted him and be waiting for the remainder of his patrol, which must be in the bushes of the big garden. It might be a reconnaissance patrol of only a few men. It might be a strong fighting patrol. He and Bilting had been caught with their trousers down. With their arms full, they could not get at their weapons quickly. The German turned his head and spoke over his shoulder. Two more figures rose from the cover of the garden and joined him at the gate. One was an NCO. Bridgman swore under his breath, and his eyes stole again to the Bren group. Laverty was grinning, and then, as if under the compulsion of the platoon commander's will, he glanced in Alan's direction. Their eyes locked. Alan jerked his head a fraction towards the road. He saw Laverty's ears move back as the skin tightened on his face, and the quick, darting search of his eyes as they swung from Alan to Bilting and onward. He saw him turn his head and shoulders, gently, his right hand drifting towards the Bren, his left closing on Hudson's arm. Bridgman looked up at the Germans. The NCO spotted him. For that millionth of a second that can last an eternity, they stared into each other's eyes. Alan dropped flat on the earth, his arms swinging free of the bandoliers, his head still raised and his gaze still on the enemy. His sten was off his shoulder and moving in front of his body. The German NCO's arms swung out to attract the attention of the men on each side of him and he opened his mouth to shout. The butt of Alan's sten was still inches from his shoulder when Laverty fired. The NCO and one of the German soldiers went down where they stood. Bridgman shot the other as he passed through the gate. The man's back arched and he stepped backwards slowly, groping with his feet like a man in pitch darkness. He half turned and one hand reached out for the gatepost. Inches short of its support, the fingers closed and his body lurched sideways, twisting as it fell. His face thudded against the post and dragged down its length to the ground. Bridgman found himself thinking of the splinters. Laverty was firing bursts into the bushes and trees and one of Brown's sections opened up from the house. During a pause in the firing, Alan heard his friend's voice bellowing to his gunners to raise their fire so that it searched the ground running back to the railway embankment. Alan looked to his right. Bilting was spread-eagled on the earth, his rifle in his shoulder, firing deliberate, well-spaced shots at the densest patches of cover. Alan thought quickly. There might be any number of Germans still in the grounds. There might be none except the casualties. 
The whole situation was much too close. He would have to find out. The CEO might oppose an immediate reconnaissance. Alan decided not to ask him. He took two men from each of the sections and had a few quick words with Brown. Then they moved down the slope across the road and lay extended behind the wire and hedge which fronted the big garden. Bridgman signalled with his arm for covering fire and he heard Gorman's section open up from the high up on the slope, firing over his head into the bushes and foliage in front of him, while from the right Brown's men were firing from their vantage point in the house at the farther cover towards the railway. He waved for the ceasefire and in the sudden silence after the shouted orders he called to the patrol. They were on their feet over the wire and through the hedge almost as one man, Murray racing for the cover of the house, three men leaping and darting round obstacles behind him. Alan moved to the right where trees interlarded the bushes. He had gone only ten yards when he saw Germans and he just had time to stop two of his men from opening fire. The Germans were crouched together as if to find comfort in numbers. There were five of them, two badly wounded, one slightly and two unhurt. They surrendered with a relief that was pathetic. Bridgman went back to the gate and waved to his platoon and when he was sure of their attention he called the Germans forward. They came out, two of them carrying one and the slightly wounded supporting another. He saw them start across the road before turning back to his men. They had already started to search the bushes and close vegetation of the garden. He took them to the north towards the railway, covered by Murray and his men from the house. They found no live enemy between the company position and the embankment. Behind the cover of the high mound, Bridgman halted his men and sat down to think. To look over its edge was inviting trouble, but he had to know what lay on the other side. He called to Bilting and together they crawled up the steep, grass-covered earthwork. Just below the brink, Bridgman motioned to Bilting to wait, and crawling on a few more yards, he raised his head cautiously, partially screened from sight by a huge thistle. Open fields and woods stretched out in all directions in front of him. He looked through his glasses but could see no sign of friend or enemy, although to the west, in or behind a thick wood, he could hear firing. He wondered what lay out of his sight in the foreground hidden by the embankment. He decided to find out. He had got no farther than the first railway line and had just started to ease his body across it when he heard the whine of the bullet over his head. The report of the rifle which had fired it reached him just as another bullet hit a metal rail and ricocheted high in the air, its nasal scream filling his ears as he scrambled to his feet and turned back. He saw Bilting's anxious face raised above the level of the embankment and then the third bullet caught him off balance before he was quite on his feet. He went down in a heap and at once started to roll towards the reverse slope. He saw Bilting clamber to the top of the embankment and start to run in his direction. He shouted to his batman to get back, but even as he shouted, Bilting half jumped in the air and as he landed, slipped on the grass rim. The two men rolled down the slope within inches of one another. At the bottom, each sat up and looked at the other and at the faces of the remaining four men. Well, asked Bridgman, are you hit? Bilting didn't speak, but he nodded and looked up at the trees. Where? Bilting swallowed and then blushed. Bridgman's control slipped for a moment, and he gaped at Bilting. It was incredible to see a man blushing in the middle of a war. He repeated his question. Where? Bilting continued to gaze at the treetops as he muttered an unintelligible reply. Bridgman became angry. For Christ's sake, man, where have you been hit? In the arse. Everyone laughed except Bilting. He turned to Bridgman. And where have you been hit, sir? Bridgman stopped laughing and tried to remember. I don't know. It must be somewhere in my shoulders or back. I can't feel anything now, but I felt a bloody great wrench at the time. It threw me over. In fact, Alan was untouched. The bullet had entered his haversack and ploughed its way through his mess tin and 48 hour pack before coming out on the far side. A protesting building was laid face downwards on the ground and his trousers were taken down. One of the soldiers said with simulated concern, You really ought to take yeast fight, mate. Your blood's out of order. There's pimples all over your arse. Bilting swore, blushing angrily again when Bridgman laughed aloud. Bilting, you've set a record. you got four holes from one bullet. It's gone in one cheek, out in the middle, into the next, and out on the far side. They bandaged him roughly, and he limped back with them to the platoon position. The others rejoined their sections, and an embarrassed Bilting accompanied Bridgman to company headquarters. Doc Barber took most wounds seriously, but he laughed when Bilting muttered out his story. <laughs>